everybody. Welcome to Holy Trinity Church. Before we begin our worship in earnest, a few things to draw your attention to. Um, so this week we uh, draw a line over what we were doing before and we start a whole new sermon series based on uh, the book of 1 John. That is John's first letter, not John the Gospel, but John's first letter. And um, the idea behind that is that, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, it's been a long six months. I'm weary. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about um, how it is that we remain joyful, how it is we remain loving uh, in the face of what is going to be, seems to be a very, very long term uh, difficulty that we find ourselves in. Um, it's going to be it's stretching out. And uh, this uh, wonderful letter shows us the nature of love and where we can find joy. And I think that's something that we really need at the moment. So that's why we're looking at one John. And we'll kick that off in a moment. Next weekend, uh, the 20th, and next Sunday, is a big day for Cara. She is being priested, um, and um, that will be uh, uh, away from here. For, unfortunately, we can't do it in a, as a home game, um, but so really looking forward to uh, that, and do be praying for Cara, uh, as that will be an important moment for her, and obviously it's been ruined again by, uh, by the pandemic. You will have heard on the news, obviously, this week, uh, that rule about six people gathering, um, outside or inside, um, that uh, just want to re reassure you that does not affect uh, our church uh, uh, meetings either um, uh, either during the week or on Sunday. So um, the main difference that will make is that yes, um, we still have to meet socially distanced in the church. We have to wear masks and track and trace that sort of thing. Under the previous guidance that we were given, it just means that you can't come in groups of more than six people at once, um, which is probably unusual for most of us anyway. Um, but for those of you for whom a, a nine o'clock communion service works, uh, that will still be happening as we are going forward. And lastly, uh, well, no, not quite lastly, but uh, do continue to give me feedback. We're, we're trying to work out whether we want to read this book. Uh, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a sort of national church book. That we're all trying to think about whether we want to read that together. Uh, if you do, um, then let me know. Um, we're, it kind of goes alongside the fact that we're trying to restart all of our small groups. Um, so uh, thinking about a, a group meeting on Thursday mornings, actually physically in church, and then our life groups meeting on Zoom as well. And if you'd like to join uh, those groups, uh, Cara's thinking about uh, running Alpha on Zoom as well. Um, if you'd like to join any of those things, uh, then do please send me an email. Well, let's uh, just uh, quiet our hearts now as we come to worship proper. Well, welcome everybody to Holy Trinity Church here in Twickenham. Uh, this is a service of online communion, and it's great to be with you this, uh, uh, this day. Let's um, just get uh, order of services off the website or wherever we find it, and we'll begin with a prayer of preparation. So we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we begin to focus our worship on the Lord Jesus Christ, and what we're doing here is a symbol of in, uh, in communion as we go on into the service. With the words of uh, communion hymn, Behold the Lamb who takes our sin away. Uh, so uh, Chris is going to play for us. Uh, let's uh, uh, assume the right position for us wherever we are in uh, in our in our lounge in our kitchen or wherever we are just uh, just take a moment and think about uh, what it is that we uh, symbolizing what it what it means for us now what it meant to Jesus back then as we sing communion hymn together
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And so we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue to pray in the words of the special prayer for today, the 14th Sunday after Trinity Sunday. So we say together, Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we begin our new series in uh, John's first letter, the letter, the first letter of John, uh, and uh, Nathan is going to read the first chapter uh, for us. So over to Nathan. The reading is taken from John chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him, and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thanks uh, very much, Nathan, for that reading.
I always think that this is one of the most extraordinary passages in the New Testament, but it's very rarely read. People always prefer to read, obviously, John's Gospel, the beginning of that, which is very similar. What's wonderful to see are those clear parallels between the two things. There's clearly the same mind at work, the same understanding of Jesus, and the same desire to blow our minds with how amazing he is. So when John says he's heard the word of life, he's seen the word of life with his own eyes, he's looked at the word of life, and his hands have touched the word of life, and that he will proclaim this word of life, what on earth is he talking about? He's not talking about a doctrine, he's not talking about an idea, he's talking about a person. The word of life is Jesus. John's seen him, he's looked at him up close, he's followed him, he's touched his skin, he knows he is real. And we're not merely being told that Jesus has eternal life or that he gives eternal life to other people. He's saying Jesus is eternal life. He is salvation itself in a person. And it's in knowing that person that we have what John describes in his gospel uh, as life in all its fullness. And what we'll hear in a moment uh, is joy. So this life, simply through being united with a person, knowing Jesus and him knowing us, that walking through life with him, it's not all about performance, it's not about good deeds, it's not about our kind words. No, all we can do is unite ourselves to him and he will unite himself to us, he will hold us. And if that's true, that we're simply saved through our union with this word of life, with Jesus, saved by grace alone, and not by what we do, but by what he has already done in history on the cross, then it's crucial that these gospel events, the big, the big parts of the gospel, the incarnation uh, at Christmas, the atonement on Good Friday on the cross and the resurrection of Easter Sunday, well, these need to be real. They need to occur in time and space. And that's exactly what John is trying to prove to us here. Again, we saw him with our eyes, we heard him with our ears, we touched him with our hands. Why is John being so emphatic about this? Well, Robert Yarbrough, uh, the New Testament scholar, says this, that the verbs correspond to the different varieties of witness evidence that was admissible in court in the ancient world. So when John speaks of seeing, hearing, touching, he's not just boasting about what a close friendship he's had with Jesus. He's swearing to you and to me, even uh, 2,000 years later, a legally binding statement of fact. He's saying this isn't just a nice set of stories, uh, but actually myself and many others are eyewitnesses of these events. And we are testifying to you that we really saw him, we saw him really live and really die, and he really rose from the dead. So verses 1 and 2 are insisting on the historicity of our faith. Verses 3 and 4 describe the goal of our faith. Because the gospel is true, John says, you can have fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. Now, what does that really mean? Because fellowship is just a bit of a churchy word, isn't it? What, you know, what does it really mean? Well, we've heard us said it. We say this at school. We've said it before in church. Fellowship is this word koinonia, and it means a relationship of mutual sharing, very much like our word communion, communing together. Communion, and that's why communion, as we share it in a few moments, uh, is communion on so many different levels uh, with the Spirit, with the Father, with Jesus, but also with each other. It's a deep, intimate, multi-dimensional bonding together. And John's saying that any believer, any of us, in fact, all of us, can enjoy that deep personal communion with God that the first apostles did, like himself. And we can have that too. So if we want to know God personally, we can't just believe a few general truths about who he is or say a few prayers to him. We really need to immerse ourselves in reading about Jesus in the Gospels. Because when we read the Gospels, we see God in human form. 
Uh, and uh, so we don't just understand the awesomeness of God like we might see in the Old Testament, but we see in Christ God's perfections, but in ways that we can relate to. We see his love, his humility, his brilliance, his wisdom, his compassion. And they're no longer abstract concepts, but in breathtaking real life ways. And because this is all about fellowship, this uh, deep communion, it brings joy. It's all about joy. Just look at verse four. John says, my joy is not going to be complete until you've got the same joy in fellowship with God as the apostles. What's he talking about in this, this word joy? Well, it simply means happiness. And that's exactly what the word means. But it's weightier than just uh, than, than just a kind of passing pleasure or a kind of giddy, fun craziness. Now, having joy from being in fellowship with other Christian people, and especially with God himself in Christ, is much more like a kind of ballast for your life. You'll have heard Nat mention uh, uh, before that during the pandemic, we've all been going through the same storm. It's, it's, pr it's pretty bad stuff. But we're all experiencing it differently because we're in different boats. Uh, that is our home circumstances, our work circumstances, our life circumstances are different. I'd say uh, each of us also have different kinds of storm damage as a result of travelling through that storm. And we're just beginning to work out what that is. But we can counteract some of that at least with this joy of fellowship with the Father and the communion of the saints uh, the communion of the saints with each other, uh, especially our own church family here at Holy Trinity Twickenham, but we also therefore enjoy fellowship with all the Christians that are alive now and also all the Christians that are in heaven. That's extraordinary. And communion with Jesus himself. And that joy is the kind of ballast that keeps our ship stable and upright in the water, whatever the storm. Now, I wonder whether... We for myself, for all of us, whether we sometimes fail to experience, if you like, that subterranean river of joy, that ballast, because of the way, the way that we actually get to this joy, the way we get this fellowship with uh, Jesus himself and each other, is really very ordinary. We, we, often, we often want something different than the ordinary. As I said, this claim of John's, that his hands have touched uh, Jesus, the word, amazes me. How could the infinite have become finite? How could the extraordinary become as completely ordinary as the human hand of a carpenter? Unimaginable greatness packed into a baby in a manger who became a man who could be killed. And so in our spiritual lives, often maybe we want pizzazz we want to be cool we want to feel miracles we want to uh, experience the kind of spiritual flashiness well christ came in weakness and smallness not to save the proud but to save those who admit that they are weak and that we do need a savior and so the christian life begins and then the christian life continues to find our fellowship with the most simple ordinary act of just humbly asking and the life of God the joy of fellowship grow in us over the years through these commonplace ordinary practices of daily saying yes to Jesus you're the, you're the boss reading our Bibles reading about him finding out what God's like in his person worshiping together even if it's uh, on this online kind of crazy way serving one another, serving our neighbours and putting our dependence right on to Jesus in these times of suffering that we're going through. As we do that, very ordinary, but bit by bit by bit, our faith grows and the foundation of our life comes closer and closer to that deep river of joy. Cara is going to lead us in our prayers now. Today's response when I say, God of love, is hear our prayer. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Loving God, 
we thank you for this new day and we thank you that we can gather to pray for the beginning of this day. We ask that you be with us in our conversations and our actions with all those that we meet on this day. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for our Archbishops, Justin and Stephen, for the Diocese of London, Bishop Sarah of London and our Aerial Bishop Graham, as they help to navigate us at this time. We pray for them as they lead us in wisdom, humility and prayer. God of love, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church here and all over the world. We bring before you our world, a world that can often seem broken, fragmented and in turmoil. We pray especially for the Christians that are persecuted across the world and for all those who are fleeing a place of danger. We pray that they may find a place of safety and welcome. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for the world we hold before you, for those in California who have been suffering from wildfires that are raging. We pray for the people of Beirut as they recover from the explosion a month ago and for the fire in the port this week. Lord, be with all those who need your love and comfort at this time. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those that are grieving, lonely, anxious or feeling worried. We pray for the sick, especially the sick of our parish and those known to us personally. We pray that your healing hand be upon them. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those that are involved in finding a vaccine for the coronavirus. We thank you for their skills and knowledge. May you continue to grow that within them. May you fill us with wisdom and understanding for the new regulations and guidelines that have been announced this week. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for all our schools, colleges and universities, for all the staff and students. May you be with them as they sp start back over the coming weeks. We pray that as they study and socialise, that Lord, they will keep themselves and others, those around them, safe. Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come now to communion. The wonderful truth that the Holy Spirit makes real for us. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It's our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word, and through him you've created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. And through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high, and through him you've sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us all a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may become for us, wherever we are, his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once and for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and we look for the coming of your kingdom. With this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink in some way these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, we ask you to renew us by your spirit, to inspire us with your love and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so, friends, wherever you are, draw near with faith by the Holy Spirit. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave it for you and his blood, which he shed for you. Receive in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Well, our final song together um, for this uh, service is a song that just reminds us again of the truths that uh, John was talking about as we read uh, the beginning of his letter. Truths that are not uh, uncertain and possible, that are not reliant on our loving nature or our behaviour, but are rooted in what Jesus has already done for us. We can look forward with confidence and assurance to how we are with God today. So we just need to come to him and let's do that now as we sing together before the throne of god above above i have a strong and a perfect plea because that plea is made by jesus
And so as we close, a final prayer of blessing together. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and all those that you love and remain with you now and always. Amen. Have a great rest of Sunday.